All right. So this is how far we got. Um, we we spent quite a bit of time kind of having fun delineating this this facade here. I did another version at home that I put on Instagram, which did a little bit more work on the storefront here. But uh, the point I think of this today's exercise could be twofold, maybe threefold, um, is that there's quite a bit of work here that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can get in here. And if we select from the left, we can take some of our work here and start to repeat it, right? <laughs> so rather than rather than reinventing the wheel every every single day uh, of a building, we can we can take portions of things and start to economize in terms of what those are. Now I got a little bit of this, that side of that parapet there, so I will hit, use the shift key and subtract that from the selection. So you can add and subtract to a selection. In SketchUp, using the Shift key, um, holding that down, and then clicking on a certain thing. But I think that will probably work. Um, so probably the first thing I want to do is, is make that a group, and then copy that to the pasteboard away from from the building a little bit. Paste it in place, Oops. and then. And I can start moving the thing, move that away like so. It is a group, so I can grab that group. And I will pick the Rotate tool. And when you hit use the Rotate tool, you get this protractor thing. And it looks for a face in which to lock on. I want to lock on the ground plane as a face. I want to hit it on an end point or tail end of that little building down there, then I need to drag out a reference line, and then I can turn it about that particular face. The angle will be referenced in the lower right where the measurement tools usually are. And I'll turn that around 90 degrees. Okay. Once I do that, it's already a group, so I can probably start to move that around or duplicated several times. I can place that now in front of my building. Making sure that it's locked onto something. It probably wants to merge with the building, so maybe we just kind of move it over there. <coughs> so you get around to this end here and continue to move it into a position in which it's not stuck to the building or merging with the building, but maybe just sitting right in front of it like so. That might be something to do. Then I select it again. It is a group. I can copy it again, paste it in place. It puts it directly into the same place it was. Now when I grab the Move tool and hold down the Shift key, it will slide along an axis Collinear with its with its origin. This will ensure that it doesn't get all completely messed up. That now is selected. Copy, paste it. Uh, copy again. Paste in place. It will put the next copy of it directly in that same position. I hold down. I grab the move tool. Hold down the shift key and make sure that it's sliding along the axis. This will help prevent pain and suffering inflicted by SketchUp putting things in pieces you don't want. Just hold down that shift key and you can slide something along the collinear, collinear with its origin. Copy, paste in place, move. Holding down the shift key, I can slide it now on that axis and put its copy relative position next to its origin. So you can take a portion of a facade and duplicate it several times rather than reinventing the wheel. And then you'll notice, well, that doesn't quite match up. I mean, you could finish out this corner with something else, obviously, or you could argue, eh, I'm really in a hurry. I need to get this street level rendering done. I'm just going to select all of these grab the scale tool, hold that box out, and just stretch it to the corner. Now, if you're working with an architect and they were measuring off of your model, well, the, the 
be upset with you, but you, you will have started to stretch out this portion of the facade and, and take it to that particular point. So by selecting multiple instances of the group, I'm holding down the shift key and I'm adding to the selection. I can move the whole group now into that corner, into that corner position. With all of them selected, I can also scale, uh, scale about that. So I can stretch out this group of facades a little bit further just so it goes from corner to corner. Okay, some things to fix, I will now. So those are groups, and I can't really do anything with them right now, so I have to, I'm gonna select them and then explode them. Now they're all individual pieces again. Now you can get in here and fix things like awnings, things like that. So you'll see this piece of the awning didn't carry over. Now I can actually extend that in here. You see sketch up a little limit, a little limit that. But if you have pieces that didn't copy over, you can you can fix those here. The stretch tool that has a little X next to it, so it's not just not just right now. Um, have you exploded the facade yet? Yeah. So you need to explode the facade before you can modify any of those tools. And we can paint those later. Um, so open up the shadow settings. Right now you can see we're casting, there's a couple of settings here turned on. We've got things casting onto the ground plane. We've got uh, things casting onto edges. Hidden under the shadow settings is a, is a little drop-down key here in the, in the corner. So, so go to Window, Shadows, open up this Shadow Settings. This is the toggle button here that turns the shadows on and off. This is the time and day settings, time, the time and month settings. So we've got a nice dramatic shadow coming from here. But there's this little drop down menu here that gives you more stuff. So turn off on ground and you'll see that you have the option now to, to have shadows cast on the faces and on the ground. That is two, two separate things here that give you some flexibility when we start to put this in, into uh, context. So, so we can see here on faces, on ground. I'm gonna turn off that on ground uh, because that shadow is not something I want to carry into our next step. I'm just gonna be using on uh, faces and put the shadows in a nice dramatic sort of place. You know, uh, in the afternoon here or in, in the morning. This model is not geolocated, so it's just kind of a general North America, but we're assuming that the sun is to the right. Um, and we're assuming that we're kind of in September, October. Um, but we just want the shadows in a certain place, and I want the, uh, the ground setting here turned off. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn on the perspective again. It's been turned off up to this point. We've been using parallel projection only. I'm going to put the model sort of in this corner setting here until so I've got a reasonable sort of corner setting just so we're kind of looking at the corner of the building and a, you know, just a reasonable, typical kind of view. And then um, I'm going to go to Google Earth and go to Anderson and start looking for an equivalent street view. I've determined here that this corner lot might work for the exercise. So we are, this is the massive parking lot. Um, 
here's the Department of Health. So this corner right here might work. One of these corners. And we've got a little bit of topography here, but this is just a surface parking lot for six or eight or 12 cars, something like that. Next to these is historic buildings or faux historic buildings. <laughs> this isn't the best photograph, but it is a corner lot that can work for this exercise. So Google Earth photo photography is referenceable. It is 2018, it's over a year old, so it's not gonna be current. It is no substitute for taking your own photos, but if you're in a pinch, <laughs> you can always go to Google Earth and get some street level views that can work for an exercise like this. Um, the other thing to remember with Google Earth views is what? What's the other thing that differentiates Google Earth views from photographs that you take? Yes? The height of the state. Right, right. So the height of the eye level or, or will that be the horizon line? Google Earth's cameras are mounted on top of a sports car and they are approximately seven, seven and a half feet uh, above ground level. Your eye level is about five or five and a half feet above ground level. So it is going to be two, possibly even three feet above what your normal eye level would be. So those are things to remember. That when you're, setting, you're setting the horizon line a little bit higher than you would if you were taking the photograph yourself. Yes? Anderson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next to this blue and teal building. Okay, thanks. Yep. So in Google Earth Pro, Google Earth Pro, we can we can export a uh, high resolution photograph. We just have to get it in a position here. We have this annoying yellow stripe, but we, you know the pavement isn't that beautiful anyway. <laughs> so we just have to get it in a position here where we need a little bit of sky, not a lot of asphalt, but probably a little bit, a little bit of sky here, and just so we can see up and down both streets. You can see that there is some topography here in Anderson to deal with, and then get ready to save that image. So in Google Earth Pro, we go to File, Save, Save Image. And then we have some map options. I turn off the, the title, description, the legend, the scale. We don't need any of that. You may need a compass, compass reference. You may need a scale reference someday. But I don't know that you need any of this stuff. Um, and so turn off all of that. We then select the resolution of the export photo. Again, it's not a perfect photo. These were taken from a moving car, right? These are photos that are stitched together, so there's going to be some variation in the photo, but we're using it for context, so um, uh, it, it works for the sake of the exercise. So you know, set it either at maximum or set it at current. You can see, though, that there's a big difference here between the current resolution or, or moderate resolution, the maximum is always going to give you a really big image that, that you can kind of rely on in terms of resolution. So I could save image, give it a name. And then we'll go back to SketchUp. Remember, I've, I've got the shadow settings open here, and I've turned off the on-ground shadow settings. Stop the video. There. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Phil. I'm not really a doctor. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now let's make the magic happen. File. Import. JPEG image used as new matched photo. So when we import JPEG images into SketchUp, we have three options. We can use it as an image, which would be like taking a corporate logo and pasting it on the side of a building, or pasting a billboard on something. 
We can use it as a texture, so if we're taking photographs of limestone or brick of a context, we can import it as a texture. The third option is use it as a new matched photo. So this option, new matched photo, import. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> what is happening here? Okay. So, um, it is now, the model is now placed into the context of the photo. We have some variations here in which to move this around. We have red for right vanishing point. Red is for right. So just in case you forget, the red bars here are lines that vanish to the right. Left is green, so there's no mnemonic device for that. The yellow bar is the horizon line, and then there is the origin point. So the origin point is the, right now is the corner of the model. So the, these are all things we have to adjust. And then there is a blue bar, which is the scale bar, by which we can scale the model up and down. This is a little bit tedious. It can be a little frustrating, but just try your best. Start with the origin point and place it on top of that concrete thing. Then start to take the, yeah, the green lines for the left vanishing point and start to try to match them to the buildings that are there. It's not going to be easy because we are actually looking downhill. They're going to have to futz around with this a little bit, but there are some vanishing lines that you could use. But it is looking downhill. You'll see here that there's a reminder that this is, has its own vanishing point but that this is actually downhill. So be careful with what lines you actually use to reference that. Just try to make the building look as close as you can. Now, the blue bar is the, is, is the scale bar. This is how I scale the building up and down. The horizon line is also adjustable. You'll see that it has an effect on the building. I want to put the horizon line probably about seven feet. There is a door over here, right, that I can use to reference the horizon line. So if Google Earth's camera is mounted on top of a small sports car and is about seven and a half, eight feet high, then if I put that horizon line just above a door frame, that'll get me kind of there. And then you'll see the red vanishing lines. We can match those to the cornice lines of our neighboring buildings and the sidewalk there, okay? So just do your very best to place the building according to the vanishing points, lines, and horizon lines that you see there. Don't forget, the origin point is important. The horizon line is important. The scale line is the blue line right there on the corner of the building. This will make the building humongous or very, very small, depending on how you scale the building. Okay. I often tell students, please, uh, to, to, I often tell students to put a human scale figure into the SketchUp model as a reference to, to help you as well. But this will, this will start to place the building onto this lot. These are the variables. So the origin point, the left vanishing point, the right vanishing point, the horizon line, and then this scale bar. So please just work on that and try to put your building into a relative position of context that will work visually. Then we'll move on. So right now the model is fairly transparent, right? So we can see through it. This is for the purposes of placing the model and being able to sort of imagine it coming in as an x-ray. We have to go to the styles menu now. So we have to say done on this little menu here, but there is a very, very dangerous button right here. Do not ever, ever press that button. <laughs> okay, that, that button is project textures from photo. What that button is for is for people who want to take four photos of a building and then create a context building from those four photographs. So the, for the people who build uh, models for the three, 3D warehouse of existing buildings, that's for them. That's not for us, okay? 
because you can actually, there are people who build uh, buildings from photographs for context models and then import them to 3D warehouse, right? You've seen them before, right? But that is for them. Do not touch that option, okay? But I'm gonna get everything to the point where I, where I feel comfortable. There are variations here in terms of the spacing grid and things like that that are helpful for reference and things like that. But uh, until I, when I get this comfortable, I'm gonna click Done. And then I'm gonna go to Window, and then I'm gonna open up the Styles menu. Because it's in the Styles menu that we can then bring back our material textures and our colors, okay? So I open up the Styles menu, I go to Edit, and then I click on the little blue box. So look for the little blue box, and then turn off the foreground photo. Where is the styles menu? Oh, never mind. This is the most important part of the exercise. Okay. I want to turn off model axes. So let's get rid of those. Okay, just want to make sure I've got everything where I want it. Materials on, we want X ray off, right? So you see the difference there. We want the X ray turned off. We want materials on. There are variations here, right? There's a simplified color palette, there's, there's an all white, there's an X ray. I mean, we don't want any of that stuff. But if you're exporting you know, to a hand drawing or something like that, then maybe these are options to think about, right? Um, these are all things that might be easier to work from in terms of a hand drawing. But for, for our for our giggles today. Uh, I want the x-ray off, and I want the materials on, and I want that foreground photo off, okay? I also remember, I noticed a couple of shadows here, you want that ground shadow turned off as well. And otherwise it's gonna cast a, yes. How would you get to those things that you were just on the x-ray thingy? Uh, they're, they're in the styles menu, and they're under edit. menu and edit. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> okay. They're all there. Yes. Okay. You ready to export? Export. 2D graphic. JPEG image. Options. We want it big. Right? We want it fairly big. So right now the view size is 1895 by 1058 on my monitor, on my computer. Of course, we, we can push it now to something much larger, 4,000, 2,000, something like that, with the anti-aliasing turned on. And this could be a JPEG, it could be a PNG, it could be a TIFF, either one. This, this, is, this, is, um, this would be now. Corner view. And then we take it to Photoshop. So I want box turned on. I want box open and I want to go to our Photoshop entourage. Hopefully you've all been sharing things. I'm noticing my name on a lot of stuff here. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's been good participation with the SketchUp components and models, but uh, do do start to download some entourage from the different free sites and getting it in there. So we, we want to open that new image, and I want to open the original Anderson Context image as well. I need to open both of those, right? So I want the context open and I want the new image open. So I want the context open and I want that image open. Okay? All right. If we really, really care about this tree, right? We then would cut around it, right, and place it in front of the building. But we can always cover that up with another tree. Right? So with that, this context image, the context image is basically for foreground elements that we care about. 
I don't really care about all this asphalt here, but I do care about these things here. Um, and and I, may, I may care about this, this lamp here, and I might care about this. I, that's possible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a foreground layer with this now. I'll take the lasso, and I'll start to make a selection. It takes us up and around the light pole. You have foreground elements that you care about. It's possible you don't care about things because they are easily replaceable in Photoshop or SketchUp. There may be things that you aren't changing, right? There's this traffic light here, this, you know, there may be elements that you're working with in context that you that you cannot change or that you are designing around. This traffic box here, the one-way sign. I don't really care about that tree <laughs> that much, but then I will select all of these elements here to create a foreground mask. What that's going to do is just cut away all the sky in the background. Delete contents. Oops, what did I forget to do? I have to unlock my background. Right. Always unlock the background layer. Forget to do that, and that deletes away those background elements. This is creating a foreground mask. Deselect, save as. This has to be a PNG now. Anderson context foreground mask. Anderson Context Foreground Mask. Okay. All right. Now we are on our new thing. I'm going to double click on the background layer to release it. And I'm going to, I don't really, I'm not married to this sky, am I? I'm not, that's not a beautiful sky. So I'm just going to, I'm going to lasso all that get rid of it. Just need to lasso around the building. select the sky as well. It's just a couple of grays. So the, the magic wand is getting better. The quick selection tool is getting better every year. I'm just going to cut all that away. Remember, you have to double click on layer zero in order to allow it, allow the ability to give you the ability to cut away that sky. Okay. Now, we have a sky. <laughs> yes, we do. We have a sky in there, right? Sky mountain. Still that our same mountain one, but uh, you know, there are other skies. <laughs> Sky Mountain. 
mountainous place. It's good to look for some skies that are pretty high resolution so that you are not stretching the dickens out of these things. Rasterize the layer, pull it below, now the sky is below it. Get the mountains out of there. I use a little bit big. Start cropping it down. I'm not married to this foreground. You can always place other things in front of it. This is where you start putting in alternative pavement, bike lanes, things like that in this foreground. layer, pavement. I'm going to do a quick thing for you here. So I'm going to pick the foreground color, this gray here. I'll pick the background color, another gray sort of in there. That will probably work. I'm going to make a gradient foreground color, background color, these two squares right here is the foreground color and background color. Embedded underneath the paint bucket tool is the gradient tool. I've got a new layer here. I'm going to make a gradient from gray to gray along this line segment and it will make a transition between one gray and another. If you want a little bit darker, just make it a little bit darker. You can see a gradient in that direction. So it can be a short gradient, it can be a long gradient. Either way, I want to make a gradient from the gray to the gray. And place that underneath. This is if you're not married to the pavement materials that are there. If you want to start adding other things, bike lanes, things of that nature. You can also take that gradient and put a texture on it or filter on it. some texture, and one of those would work. But, you know, this, this then gives you a blank slate by which to place new elements. Bikes, people, cars, things of that nature. Just gives you the beginning of a blank slate. If you're not married to what's there in terms of the street context. So that's a pavement layer, that's a sky layer. Of course, all these can be you can change the opacities of all of these, right? You can make them more opaque or less opaque, more powerful, less powerful. Stylize them. If you want a pink sky, put in a pink sky. <laughs> okay. Today's renderings are becoming more and more and more abstract as you look at some of the post-digital rendering styles that are out there on Instagram and, and, uh, and elsewhere. You, you'll notice that folks are getting more abstract, not less abstract. So. You may want to take some artistic license with the context buildings. You know, let's say you put these black and white, it puts more emphasis on your proposal. So start to take on some artistic license in terms of how you want to start portraying these different these different elements. They're all in different layers, right? So they you have all that, you have that option. You have those options. Now I want to place my new foreground layer, place embedded. This was a PNG that we just made, the foreground mask. That comes in like so, right? This has this has now. This brings back our foreground elements, including including the street, right? But it brought back that light pole, brought back these these particular street elements. I'm not in love with them, but if you're designing in a context where that that does exist, <laughs> then then those are good things to have. So that is a PNG, and again, I can cut away now the elements that I don't care about, particularly that yellow line. But that foreground mask helps preserve. I have to rasterize the layer first. 
Now, I have the rulers turned on, so under View Rulers, those rulers are visible. I'm going to drag a reference line to relative position of the horizon line based on where we did it in SketchUp. Place it just above the door, probably there. And remember now, all people that we place in the foreground are going to be below that horizon line because our horizon line was higher. So, um, download a few people and elements, and you can, be, you can continue to collage those in. So, I've got a few downloaded already, so I'll just open those up. Elements. I've got a folder already of stuff. start downloading from Skalgoer or non Scandinavia or download them piece by piece. Same for the, so pick out different skies, pick out different trees, cars, things of that nature. Just start populating the thing. <coughs> That's you. There are a couple of trees in here. They're not super great. They're, I'm sure there's better ones out there. So we do need to build up, start building up our library. right. Um, you can always rasterize that particular layer and you can change its opacity and it will start to fall in in line with everything else. Just know that just by changing the opacity of something, whether it be that tree or these people, it will start to fall in line with everything else. Notice how that tree is really loud and really like day glow. If I change the opacity down, it just starts to fall into place, right? I'm in Photoshop, I can duplicate the layer quickly rather than placing it again. And I can have multiples of that tree. That tree will start to look repetitive, so there are, you may want to flip it, right? And so that you don't get too many duplicates of that thing. Otherwise, all the trees will look the same. Mm -hmm. A little the same. Transform, rotate. Flip, flip horizontal, so now I flip that tree. And I can scale it up. So just by flipping a tree, it, it makes it different than its neighbors, and it just gives a little enough, enough variation. Okay. Um, hmm. So the 
ground mask we had, we had these elements. Again, you may want to take artistic license with the context. You know, there are different artistic effects that you could put onto the context to make your work stand out. Uh, so, so experiment with those, with those things. Anything else here? Let's Just curious, how come you didn't use the spot healing tool to get rid of the yellow line instead of making it all randomly gray? Because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent question. The spot healing tool can, can do wonders because uh, those tools now are all content aware and because they're able to respond to the pixels around them and then quickly get rid of things. Yeah. Because I'm so old, I'm not used to the newer tools, and so yes. Okay. yes. But yes, that is an option. That is an option. Good observation. Uh, there are some, there, and again, there, there are some pavement things in here too, but start downloading pictures of bike-friendly intersections and then start to use those as foreground elements, right? Start to download interesting paving patterns that you like and use those as foreground elements. Uh, all of these start to become part of your digital catalog. And then I've got some foreground elements here too. There's a foreground tree somewhere in here. You'll notice I have them listed as foregrounds. download this honey locust tree and just get a foreground tree going here. Just make this really big. Just get a little bit of this in the foreground. Just want a little bit of a foreground mask. And that's a little pixelated, so I, I want to rasterize this and change its opacity so it's not as offensive. And if something's pixelated and you just don't know what else to do with it, put a blur on it. It works pretty well to just put a blur on that tree. Not that far, <laughs> but it makes it less concentrated you want you want the focus to be on yeah the blurs do work I mean see it now now our you know it's working as as a foreground element and we could think think of this as the same thing here you have to rasterize them first right you have to rasterize that layer oh gosh what happened <laughs> okay. and I put a just put a, a blur on him and then where are, where's our family here? They have to be rasterized, and then we can put a blur on them. So the focus is not on, the focus is back on our development, right? So, so these are all artistic licenses that we can start to impact. Um, at this point, you, you want to save the font because you want to save all of these layers in their configuration. So for sure, you want to save the file as a Photoshop file or as a TIFF because it will preserve the layer structure. And then, after it's saved, I, I flatten the image. And that will discard all the hidden layers and will put the layer structure in its current configuration. It will make a big sandwich. It also get rid of the transparency and basically show everything as is. So now everything is baked together, layered together. And then finally, um, we can then filter the whole thing. So if we go into our filter gallery, we can, it will make elements that don't look like they're from other places, you know, that don't belong together, actually look like they belong together. So you want to experiment with these different artistic things, these different filters. They will have great impact in terms of how the model looks. But just know that you turn your brush size down, you get more out of it. You turn the definition up or down, right? You get different effects. In my experience, the watercolor filter works pretty well if it's a high definition image, if it's a high resolution image. 
it works pretty well in terms of baking everything together in a workable casserole. Um, so it will take elements and pieces and parts from multiple sources and make them look like they belong together. Notice how the building kind of looks like it belongs there now. And uh, that's, that's the effect of a watercolor filter, taking all of these pieces and parts and baking them together. Um, notice how it really starts to blend in with the foreground trees. So they, don't, they look like they belong together. But you do have to really be careful with shadow intensity and brush detail and things like that because it, it will look really, really messy otherwise. So I turn all that stuff up, making sure it's a pretty high resolution image, click OK. And that then starts to make, get, starts to give us the impression that these things do belong to one another. So a filter can really unify a collage style rendering differently than if, if making it look like it's from a bunch of different parts of pieces. Now we're still not there yet, right? There's still things to be done, right? There's mistakes, there's, there's elements, there may be more foreground and, uh, elements, so more people here would work, right? Uh, maybe putting a planter or a tree grade underneath each tree would work. Populating things here would work. The windows are quite blue, so maybe you know you try out the gray glass windows as opposed to the blue windows. You know these different things, uh, but we we are getting the impression on uh, a blue uh, sky, sunny day that we are getting some reflections from the upper, upper story windows. Maybe we go with gray glass windows. You know, there's different variations along the steps, but this gets you into a position now where you can take a SketchUp model, put it in context, populate it and really move a proposal forward for an infill situation like this, right? So, and, and allows you to use that photo match feature to quickly propel uh, a simple urban building and put it into context and put it into a presentation in which you're making a pretty clear proposal that you want to develop this particular corner lot. So, so it moves the conversation forward, right? It moves the vision forward moves the conversation forward and allows you to put your proposals into context. Okay.